is called assembling string amplitudes. And I really mean assembling. So I'm not explaining every detail. I'm focused on certain details that I think are the ones that are most conducive to interactions with mathematicians. Hopefully in the future, mathematicians will compute string amplitudes, no problem from scratch. So I'd like to start by referring back to video M6. So I recommended for the previous lecture, lecture one, that you take a look at video M6, which is Kronecker's limit formulas. What I do in this video is I look at the partition function or zero point amplitude of a K3 overfold, like T4 of a Zn. And I claim that the partition function of a scalar boson as a function of tau is basically the Dedekind eta function that we talked about last time, divided by the Jacobi theta function, theta one, evaluated at gamma, where gamma, as I've introduced before, is the orbifold sector k, which is an integer that runs from zero through capital N, divided by capital N. And similarly, we say that the partition function of two fermions is theta nu, where nu is an integer that runs from two to four here, of gamma, again, divided by eta of tau. The reason this nu appears, these three different partition functions for these fermions, the way I get these partition functions is to start with our beloved kronecker eisenstein series from lecture one. We do it by exponentiation. So we exponentiate this, and then we get expressions like these. And that is the second limit form in particular. The reason that the Green's function is related at all to the zero point function, partition function, is that these are free theories. In a free theory, the only one loop diagram you can draw is the circle. In a free theory, there's no diagram, for example, where you have a dash like this, because there's no three-point vertex. And you don't have this diagram where there's a four-point vertex. So you only have this kind of single Green's function. And we exponentiate, you get these partition functions. So I claim this is an 1800s mathematical result that this relates to that. But let's put this in perspective in physics. So in classical field theory, I told you that the world sheet supersymmetric poly action, its Lagrangian contains a psi term that looks like this. So psi is a fermion field on the world sheet. So it depends on this parameter z that we were talking about. And if we do the variations, we compute the other Lagrange equations, we get the equation of motion for this field psi. So can you in your head tell me what is the equation of motion for a field with this Lagrangian? So you get psi mu is zero. I would actually call this the while equation in this context. And you may be more familiar with this in three plus one quantum field theory, but this is the while equation in the one plus one or two plus zero dimensions. It happens to also have a more mathematical name, which is that it's the Cauchy Riemann equation, sometimes called the equations, because if you write an imaginary part and real part, it's looked like two equations. But this just tells us that this psi is holomorphic. However, in physics, sometimes the word holomorphic is used to mean what mathematicians call it, meromorphic. But if it really satisfies this everywhere, then it is truly holomorphic. It only depends on z. In quantum field theory, you're going to have possibly delta functions on the right-hand side. So you're going to have a Green's function, and you're going to have a delta function. So this is the Green's function for the while equation in my language. Coordinate mu, which you kind of mentioned, runs from 0 to 9. These don't talk to each other in the free theory uh, between different directions. Number 1 is only correlated with number 1. Number 9 is only correlated with number 9, and so on. So in effect, we only have to write a single scalar Green's function. By the way, the Green's function is never a scalar in the sense of Gordon transformations or conformal transformation. It's a bi-scalar, and this can cause some confusion uh, when you're working in current space. But here we can pick a flat metric on the world sheet torus, and then we don't worry too much about that. So the solutions of this equation on the complex plane, does anybody know what is the Green's function of the while equation on the complex plane? Any holomorphic function would satisfy this away from zero. So any holomorphic function. But if I put specifically a single pole, we can integrate this and we get one by some normalization. So this is actually the Green's function of the while equation on the complex plane. On the torus, this gets generalized, function of the marked point z and the torus parameter tau. Whereas usual, tau is this parameter and z is my marked point. I really picture another point zero and z being relative to that point. Because the Green's function is truly a function of two points. But in electrostatics, we get used to this idea that we put the point charge at the origin. Generically, we would have had two points, z and z prime. And this here would be the difference between the points. On a flat torus, this translation invariance, so you can move it to wherever you want. But on a double torus with a non-trivial metric, 
you can't. Just like we did in the video nine, you can guess that the Green's function should look something like this. And the argument is just like video nine for the bosonic fields, this goes linearly to zero. So this goes to Z for Z goes to zero. So that means that this will reduce to the complex plane Green's function for small distances. So when the Z goes close to the origin, it will look like it does on the plane, which is a requirement. Whereas this thing does not go to zero for Z goes to zero, it goes to constant or tau dependent constant, but it allows us to have quasi periodicity. So this we put there so that this can be quasi periodic as we go around the torus and I will index that by nu. And I intend the same nu as up here. So here nu was two or three or four. So it's the same nu. So these fermions are gonna be labeled by this index nu. What that means is this quasi periodicity Two, three, four label, if you go around the two cycles of the torus, if you go this way, or if you go that way, then these fermions could have a plus or minus, a minus plus, or a minus minus. The, mi the plus plus, the completely periodic fermion is the first so-called spin structure, and that is not included here because that would be trivial in this construction. If I want residue one as d goes to zero, then I need to normalize this. Is so I simply put whatever the derivative is of this at zero, I divide that out because this is what gets left over when I take this limit. And because this was a constant at z equals zero, I just divide by that constant. So I multiply by this normalization and then I have an object that has a single pole as z goes close to the origin, quasi-periodicities of worksheet fermions that allow a sign when they go around the torus, and it has the right residue as z goes to zero to recreate this object on the plane. In the paper with Michel that I referenced in the course page, in equation 210, you can actually get this object from this by taking a z derivative and setting s equals one half and then up to some normalization. So to repeat what I said, if you understand from video nine how you get this object more or less, we got it by Fourier expansion, then you can actually get the fermion object by differentiating with respect to z and then setting s equals to one half instead of one as we did for the bosons. Beautifully explained neck of ours lecture notes that I referred to in the course notes. See the course notes. If you require this to be meromorphic and require this quasi-periodicity with a simple pole, I think this is the unique solution with the residue one. But to me, that's just a statement that you're solving this differential equation with this specified quasi-periodicity. You don't have to additionally demand that it's holomorphic away from zero because that's built into this equation. There's a beautiful paper, which I also referenced in the course notes by Schellekens and Warner, where they relate the ratio of Jacobi theta functions to exponentials of Eisenstein series. Jacobi himself, he introduced theta functions, although he copied them from people before him, as a building block, which is itself not elliptic. Elliptic here means doubly periodic, meaning it's periodic in both directions on the torus and meromorphic. So it's holomorphic away from isolated poles. Jacobi wanted to create elliptic functions, but he knew the Jacobi functions were not, but he realized that ratios between them can be made doubly periodic. So the square of this object, you get rid of this sines, and therefore the square of this object is an elliptic function. So this was Jacobi's way to construct them. And the alternative is Weierstrass way, which is in Apostol. Apostol talks about how to construct the Weierstrass pair function so my plans for today is to compute three examples of string amplitudes. And one of them will be a cylinder amplitude. I will cheat a little bit. So I will just say, we're going to take a holomorphic part, the partition function of x, psi, and psi tilde. That means we just look back at what we had and we remove the absolute value squared. And holomorphic square is, is ambiguous, but this will be enough for what we're trying to do here. So then I claim this is the partition function. When I write the partition function of k3, I really mean are six times K3. Sorry, I wrote three, it should be four. The sum from two to four of this sign, and then we sum over overfull sectors. And then we have this theta nu of zero, theta one prime of zero squared. And then we have two factors of this overfull partition function. Okay, it gets a little tight here. So this is theta nu of K over N, theta nu of minus K over N. Theta one of k over n, theta one of minus k over n. This may not yet look so familiar to some of you, but if you looked in the Mathematica file from lecture zero, which you were supposed to have looked in briefly, you will know that this is what? If you perform this sum of theta functions, you get zero. 
So this partition function actually vanishes, and you can think of that as a consequence of space-time supersymmetry. So what I'm saying is that this is just the holomorphic part of the thing that we had here. If you multiply these two together, you get theta nu over theta 1. And the holomorphic part of that is this piece. So this is the first two real dimensions of K3, and these are the second pair of real dimensions of K3. Whereas this comes from the R6. So this is the R6 part of the compactification. So this expression is actually equal to, if you just had 10 non-compact dimensions, the partition function would reduce to just this combination. But then this part, if you look at it, you see that there are two powers of this, but this looks suspiciously like the normalization we had in the Fermi and Green's function, except it's upside down. If we put the z equals gamma or k over n, then this looks suspiciously like what we had in the k3 partition function. This whole object is actually equal to the r10 partition function times the Green's function evaluated at k over n times the Green's function evaluated at minus k over n. To give the physical interpretation, I'd like to say that if which we'll do in a second, if you were to compute a four-point scattering amplitude on a torus in R10, then the orbifold means you put a background. So here's my orbifold, just represented by a cone, it has a conical singularity. So this is my orbifold. And some of the orbifold provides a gravitational background for scattering. So that if you plug in these Green's functions, then it's as if you computed a two-point function, but you have this orbital background. This is begging for that comparison to be made, in my opinion. All I said was that this expression is equal to that expression, where this is the fermion Green's function on the torus from the previous page. If you accept this too easily, I remind you that potentially confusing things that this is supposed to be a vertex position, the position of vertex operators that are inserted on the world sheet. K over N is just a number that has to do with the background. It has nothing to do with the specific point on the torus. So this is a, something to maybe think about. All right, so now we're finally getting to my example one. So I promised to do three concrete examples of string computations today. But I'm going to sketch the computation of four gravitons at one loop in 10 flat dimensions. If you do every excruciating detail, this is a somewhat long calculation, but I would maintain that it's actually more efficient than the equivalent calculation in quantum field theory. So I think this is one of the examples where it's pretty obvious that string theory is a smart way to do at least some of these computations. Just to orient yourself, if you reduce this on a six torus to four dimensions, what is the theory called that you get from this reduction and taking the field theory limit? Does anybody know? This is n equals eight supergravity. So maximally supersymmetric supergravity. And when you first learn things, I at least had the impression that, okay, now you're doing something really complicated. You're starting with an example that's way complicated. But actually, I like Neymar Kahneman's way to talk about this, the harmonic oscillator of the 21st century. These things look complicated from a spectrum point of view. They have lots of fields and some non-trivial interaction terms. From the point of view of quantum corrections, this is really the simplest thinkable graviton interactions. In computing amplitudes, you keep signs. So if you have something that's non-zero, some divergence that's non-zero, you, you add something else, well, it might have a minus sign. You cancel that loop divergence. So you can really constructively build these things up from adding stuff and then seeing what you need to add. The graviton vertex operator, I already wrote down. Let's recall it. It's V grav equals V zero, V zero tilde, where V zero, as you can think of as a photon vertex operator or a gauge boson vertex operator is dx mu plus, now I'm going to get this straight, p nu, psi nu, psi mu, e to the i p dot x. I'm not going to go through every step. What you want to compute in the end of the day is a four-point correlation function of four of these gravitons. So I'm going to number them one, two, three, and four. And then these vertex operators carry the space-time information. Recall that this is the polarization, and this is the space-time momentum. So this information is carried inside of this stuff. I'm going to focus on correlation functions of these fermions. And the reason is that if I pick 
to a few of them. For example, if I pick only these parts of these partition operators, I get zero for a similar reason to why I got zero in the partition function before. Basically, when you're trying to compute something non-zero, you need to put in enough stuff that you get something not zero. I take these fermion pairs, and I'm going to just schematically put psi psi and then put one under it. Psi psi two, psi psi three, psi psi four. Okay, and then I have product of these exponentials, p dot x, four of these. i is one to four for p i x i. To a mathematician, what I'm saying now is completely incomprehensible. But I think it's okay if you have some quantum field theory stuff in the middle of your calculation, and then the thing at the end is the one you want to discuss with your mathematician friend. Between us, people know quantum field theory, you say we use Wick's theorem to replace this with contractions. So complete contraction is psi 1, psi 2, psi 2, psi 3, psi 3, psi 4, and the last guy with the first one. So this is what I would call a chain contraction. It goes in a circle. What we're doing is just looking at solutions of the Schwinger Dyson equation where we have delta functions and we're organizing things so that we only get the contributions with the Green's function and everything else at the end is normal order and has the expectation value zero. And this can actually be made precise and it is discussed by pretty rigorous mathematicians. In my video about quantum field in two dimensions, I give some references where you can actually explain this to mathematicians. But not all mathematicians are terribly interested in this kind of combinatorial question. If you just pick the holomorphic part of the first one and the second one, the third one, and the fourth one, you get this, and then you get absolute value squared, where that means then do the same thing for the psi tilde. So just counting here, we're going to get four Green's functions, with the arguments are going to be difference of 1, 2, difference of 2, 3, difference of 3, 4, difference of 4, 1. And for now, not write this absolute value squared. What we're really doing is the following. We're going to have this R10 partition function, because we're in R10. That I wrote before. And then we have four of these Green's functions that I told you about that are indexed new, these quasi periodicities. The arguments of these, I'm just going to schematically call x1, x2, x3, x4. They arose, as I said, from the differences. So this could be something like z1 difference z2. But all I need to know to perform this sum over new is that they sum to zero. So x1 plus x2 plus x3 plus x4 is equal to zero. And you see that also from this chain where everything is repeated twice with opposite sign. If we put less than eight of these psi's, we get zero. This partition function R10 had four theta functions. And we need to cancel enough theta ones so that theta one doesn't get evaluated as zero and therefore giving us zero. In the notes, I talk about the quartic Riemann identity so the thing to remember is that you need to have four of these to get something non-zero. In this normalization, then actually this is equal to one. So the sum over all this stuff, this was the R10 partition function, power four there. And they have four, which is this total thing. This is the Fermi Green's function. Then you get everything cancels when you perform this sum and you get just one. That doesn't mean the answer is one. That just means that this theta function part of the calculation, which is the one you can easily discuss with a mathematician, like Riemann, that part is one. But that's already an important and useful realization. The whole thing isn't one. We still have this exponential contraction that I wrote there. e to the i p dot x i left, where i goes from one to four. And this is called the Koba Nielsen factor. I'm going to connect this now to what we did in lecture one. Um, the four point closed string, meaning graviton in this case amplitude, where I define the Mandelstam variables as alpha prime divided by two, the sum of these momenta, and then square in, in the Minkowski sense. So this is equal to alpha prime dot ki dot kj. This dot means it's ki mu kj mu. In Euclidean R10, this just means contract with the Euclidean metric, ki mu kj nu. So the Mandelstams are the usual Mandelstam variables from field theory. You may know them as st and u, but here we'll call them things like s12, s13, and s23. And instead of giving them names that like t and u that is specific to a four point. When you go to higher point, you need to have more generic names, but they are really the same things. My amplitude depends on the Mandelstams that are constant from the point of the world sheet and this tau parameter of the world sheet. So 
this was a parenthesis. This is equal to integral over the punctures. So if I have n punctures, here I have four punctures, and this is the closed string. We can call this a measure on the four punctured torus. Well, it just means integrate over positions of the z's, and then later you integrate over tau. So all we have here is this Kobe-Nielsen thing. And after performing the contractions, you get some i smaller than j from one through four, s i j g i j. This is now the boson Green's function because these are correlation functions of the excess, not of the size. And the sub g i j means g i j is defined as the bosonic Green's function evaluated at the difference between points. And to connect to lecture one, this can be expanded in the s i j which really means expand in alpha prime because Sij was proportional to the string length squared alpha prime. And so if you expand in alpha prime, that just counts how many Sij's you have. So the first term will be one, and the next term will be two times our friend modular graph function. So I'm just gonna write this down to make clear that this is something explicit and computable. I'm gonna write down the next term before I comment on what this really means. We get a modular graph function that looks like this plus four times a modular graph function that has three dots in a chain, times S12, S23, S13, plus other terms that involve higher modular graph functions. So now you should get this feeling like you're doing quantum free theory. You're computing some Feynman diagrams. If you just want to work to second order or third order, you only need to have a finite and pretty small number of graphs until you get to higher order. Of course, it proliferates. And here's the quiz question before we take a break. What was this? We computed this in lecture one using the Kronecker Eisenstein series as a Green's function. And what do we get for this object? Second non holomorphic Eisenstein series. Okay, this one you can do by the same method as we did this object, and that is homework problem 3.3a. And then homework 3.3b is to reduce this one to something like that. And that's why this modular graph language is useful because you find pretty algorithmic ways to reduce complicated graphs to a little bit simpler graphs. I'm not at all saying that this is who invented these things, but I think this is a nice explanation of it. So these things are still under development. So you find that the most recent papers are probably where to look because people have condensed them and made the notation more efficient. So what about this thing? Zagier actually figured out how to reduce this graph with three Green's functions. We have momentum conservation at each vertex. And by momentum conservation, I mean world sheet momentum. So if I call it P, not to be confused with the P mu I had before, this is M plus N tau. So this discrete world sheet momentum is conserved at these vertices. Sagi has shown that this is actually equal to something that is honestly an Eisenstein series plus a constant, which is Riemann zeta of three. So this kind of reduction you see, then it starts being very useful because I claim this is just holomorphic Eisenstein series third one. And this is all now completely systematic to the point where you get a Mathematica package that computes this for you and knows the reductions like this. And it's written by Jan Gerken, and it's beautifully explaining his PhD thesis from last year. And if you want to do homework 3.3, you can either do it by hand or you can use Jan's Mathematica package. So before we take a short break and I do example two and three, are there any questions about this example one, which I remind you was the scattering of four gravitons on the torus? I hid a bunch of stuff in these arrows, and I was trying to tell you that this stuff that I'm hiding is exactly stuff that mathematicians are maybe not super interested in this point because it's all constant with respect to the world sheet variables z and tau. But for physics, it's very important. So if you look in these papers I'm referring to, they will explain to you. So m is literally what I wrote here. It begins with one. So the comment in addition, or I mean, it's multiply, but in addition to m for closed, which really goes as one plus alpha prime. So this kinematic factor, which is called T8, and is discussed in Polchinski chapter 12. And the kinematic factor T8 tells you that this gives you an R to the four term, where R is the Riemann tensor. This is in the Lagrangian, so this gives a correction to Einstein's field equations at order alpha prime cubed. You get that at tree level already. So this term is a one loop correction to the tree level alpha prime correction in, for example, type 2b string theory, or in the field theory limit in n equals state supergravity. These terms here, because they have additional powers of momenta, because remember S is the invariant form from the space-time momenta, these then correct things like covariant derivatives of the Riemann tensor, nabla n, rm. 
So these are loop corrections that correct these kind of objects in the effective action. It's a question that people don't ask a lot, but I think it's very interesting. So, I mean, you can certainly write down these expressions without taking any limit. One very long term objective in this business, like modular graph functions, is to organize things such that you could resum, at least resum classes, classes of pieces of string amplitudes. So one thing, for example, is to resum different orders in loop. Of course, that's very difficult. Another would be to resum different orders of legs in external states. But another would just be to resum different orders in alpha prime. What always remains, if you resum a subclass, what are you really going to learn about the full result? Experience field here is that it can be useful to resum classes of diagrams. I'm thinking of things like BFKL, very long calculation of leading logs in QCD. I would say it has been very influential and very useful in QCD. So I do think that resumming some easily identifiable subclass, you can make progress on the complete problem. My goal after the break is to look at example two and three, which are orbifold string amplitudes. And that will introduce us to things like theta lifts, and then eventually the Rankin-Selberg-Sagi method, which my hope is to at least say something about it.